Praise God. Revelation chapter 2. Such a blessing to be going through this book with you all. I don't know if it's a blessing for you. It's a blessing for me. I enjoy seeing y'all week after week. Uh, So thanks for tolerating me. Amen? No, don't amen that. Come on. You guys might have had your fill of me, but I love seeing your faces. Revelation chapter 2, verse 8. Let's uh, read the scripture for today. We'll pray up and dive in. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and who has come to life says this, I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you into prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. Let's pray. Father, thank you for bringing us all here today, safe and sound, blessing us with this this building that we can gather in. Lord, and as we gather in this building, you fill this building by your spirit. We thank you for meeting us here. We thank you for your scriptures, for your word that you've preserved, you've made so available to us. Please, Buried in our hearts this morning, Lord. Fill the storehouses of our hearts with your word. Don't let us forget whatever you teach us today. Keep it in our minds, Lord. Keep our minds renewed. We look to you now. Sit at your feet. Teach us by your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Chapters 2 and 3 in the book of Revelation are... Seven letters to seven literal churches at the close of the first century. Last week, we looked at Christ's first letter, his letter that was to the church of Ephesus. And if uh, you'd, it would have been the first stop on the postal route for delivering these seven letters. Uh, in Ephesus, they did a lot of good things, uh, but the issue with the Ephesian church was that they left their first love. They stopped preeminently loving Christ, even though they continued to serve him. In chapter 2, verse 17, we read, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It's plural. So each church was to read each letter and, and glean and learn from the entire book of Revelation. The church at Ephesus didn't only receive the letter written to Ephesus. Uh, they would have all received a copied manuscript of the book of Revelation, the entire book. So we want to make sure we don't disassociate and disengage with any one letter, especially uh, with today's letter surrounding the persecuted church, because here in the West, we just don't receive much of it. Um, So it's good to read scripture like this and have our minds awakened to the realization that that all around the world, throughout history, the church has been persecuted and still is. So let's jump into verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the first and the last who was dead and who has come to life says this. Uh, to To the angel, the messenger of the church, most likely the overseer, the pastor of that church in Smyrna. Smyrna unlike Ephesus, still exists today. The old city and its ruins are always being uncovered and it's tucked away right into the thriving city of Izmir in in modern-day Turkey. It's situated just 35 miles north of Ephesus on the west coast of the Aegean Sea, and it was the most treasured city in Asia. It was known as the ornament of Asia, the crown of Asia, the flower of Asia. In the heart of the city of Smyrna, was a landlocked harbor. 
making its ports the safest in the region. Some regarded it as the finest harbor in all the world. It controlled trade of the rich Hermas Valley, and it was a great, wealthy, important city. Uh, if you would leave the port in Smyrna and just head west, you would run right into Athens, the gateway to all of Europe. It was the closest port to Europe from Asia, uh, and it was so prominent. All of, its city, all of its citizens exalted their city. They had a lot of pride in their city. They regarded it as the chief city of Asia. So naturally, Christ, when addressing this self-exalting church of, of Smyrna, or the city of Smyrna, Jesus introduces himself as the first and the last. That before stone was ever laid in Smyrna, Jesus was, and he'll be there long after she's gone. He's pointing out his eternality. And Smyrna's claim to fame was that they were, once were dead, but then they'd been resurrected from the ashes. A quote from Keithley. Smyrna had been a Greek colony as far back as 1000 BC. And around 600 BC, it was invaded and destroyed by the Lydians. And for 400 years, there was no city at all. Around 200 BC, Lysimachus, uh, Alexander the Great's successor, one of his successors, had rebuilt as a planned and unified whole. And it was built with the streets that are broad and straight and sweeping and beautifully paved. The, spirit, the city had experienced death and had literally been brought back to life. This is undoubtedly why uh, Christ refers to himself as he who was dead and has come to life. Smyrna received its name from its chief export, perfume, myrrh. This was a Smyrna, get that, okay. This was a gum resin taken from a shrub-like tree. And though it had a bitter, perfume, a bitter taste, the resin was used for making sweet perfume. And the process of harvesting myrrh is quite interesting. The tree isn't cut down, but a tool like a chisel is used, and they call it wounding the tree, and they wouldn't kill it. Uh, they make these wounds, and then after about two weeks, they, they go and the resin would come forth, and it looks like tears. And then after about two weeks, it starts to scab over and harden, and then they, they harvest it. And it's used as a sweet aroma. And they do this to the same tree over and over again. They don't kill it. They just keep wounding it. Pretty fitting. It sounds like the persecuted church, doesn't it? Offering up the sweet aroma of their service through their, their hardships and their trials that they persevere through. Throughout the Bible, there's the threat of myrrh being used. In Exodus uh, Exodus chapter 30, it was the anointing oil for the priests. When the wise men came and visited Jesus when he was born in Matthew 2.11, after coming to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. In Psalm 45.8, it was a prophecy of Jesus. All your garments are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. In John 19.39, we see the fulfillment of that Psalm 45 prophecy. Nicodemus, who had first come to him by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds of weight, so that they uh, took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen, wrappings with the spices as the burial custom of the Jews. And it's likely that the myrrh that was laid on Jesus when he was both born and buried, both came from this city of Smyrna, that it was exported from there. Let's see what Jesus has to say to its believers, the first part of verse 9. I know your tribulation and your poverty. The Greek word for tribulation is the common term, philipsis, and it means pressure, literally crushing beneath the weight. There was an ancient form of torture where a victim would be laid on his back and then have weights placed on him one by one uh, until he would start to be crushed and he couldn't breathe. And that's the feeling of the believers in Smyrna, a constant worsening pressure from everyone around them. Smyrna was a free city as they had pledged their fealty to Rome. Cicero called it one of our most faithful and most ancient allies. 
One commentator said this quote, Smyrna was a long, staunch ally of Rome. In fact, its citizens were so infatuated with Rome that in 195 BC, they built a temple in which Rome was worshipped, Rome the city itself. A century later, the Roman general, uh, Sulla's ill-clad, the army faced a bitter winter weather. And when the Roman soldiers' plight was announced in a general assembly of the Smyrna, of Smyrna citizens, they reportedly took off their own clothes to send to them. Rome rewarded Smyrna's loyalty by choosing it above all other applicants as the site of the new temple dedicated to the emperor Tiberius in 80, uh, 26 AD. And when an earthquake destroyed the late city in the second century, Emperor Marcus Aurelius rebuilt it. End quote. Smyrna was infatuated with Rome, and Rome adored her ally. So you can imagine the societal pressure a born-again Christian would feel when they're the only ones not entering the temple of Zeus or Apollos. Rome imposed their state religion, and Smyrna could have their freedom as long as they towed the line. And if word got out that these Christians refused to worship the emperor and the pantheon gods, it would be trouble for Smyrna. Uh, So there was an immense uh, social pressure coming down on the Christians in Smyrna. Everyone hated them because commerce was good, business was booming, the harbor was secure, the city was beautiful, and these Christians want to pick a fight with Rome by not worshiping the emperor. Rome, who who built this place, Rome, who's the reason why it's so great to live here. All of their comfort and well-being was accredited to Rome. So when you consider this from a worldly standpoint, they have a really good point. If I were them, I'd hate the Christians too. They're putting my good life in jeopardy. But the believers of Smyrna knew that this life wasn't everything. So when the pressures came, they didn't cave. Jesus says, I know your tribulation and your poverty. Uh, There are three pressures of the Christians of Smyrna that, that they would have faced. One is poverty. Because they didn't worship the Roman gods, they were cast out and ostracized. The Jewish community had already done this to Christians. They already treat them like lepers, but now they're not getting anything out of the Gentiles. They shut their doors too. No one would hire them because they didn't worship the gods of the trade unions. No one would do commerce with them. They couldn't make a living. They were so deeply plunged into poverty. There are two Greek words used for poverty. Penetes, which means a man who's forced to work. You know, day by day, hard labor. He's working class. He works to survive daily, no leisure time. The old saying goes, you dig the ditch to get the money to buy the bread to get the strength to dig to the ditch. That's them. Whereas the Greek word used uh, here is tohaya. That means to have nothing. You've been reduced to beggary. The poorest of the poor who could beg from a people if the people didn't hate them. So they were worse off than the average beggar. And in the midst of having nothing, Jesus tells them, but you are rich. Turn your Bibles please, to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Luke 12, we'll start in verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, as Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. What a stupid thing to ask Jesus. You got God Almighty in front of you, and that's what you ask him. But he said to him, Man, he didn't say it like that. Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Then he said to him, Beware And be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his own possessions. That's how the world thinks, right? If you got a big retirement and your house is paid off, 
you made it. You've won at life. God does not think that way. Look at verse 16. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for you many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own all that you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. To have a mountain of treasure. God says, that's not true riches. The church in Smyrna were rich toward God because all they had was Jesus. What a blessing not to have the snares of riches, that stumbling block. And it's a snare. Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go to heaven, than enter the kingdom of God. And again, he tells us in Matthew 6, 12 through 21. Sorry, 20 through 21. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Smyrna had no earthly treasure whatsoever, so their whole heart was in heaven with Christ. That's why they were rich in God. It's not about how much we have. It's about how much God has of us. That's what it means to be rich in God. How much of our heart does God possess? It's okay to have stuff. Enjoy things that the Lord has blessed you with. Um, Just hold on to it lightly. We don't want him to have to break our fingers if he ever decides to remove it from us. Amen? The second pressure Smyrna felt, the second half of verse 9, and the blasphemy by those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. These were the religious Jews uh, who claimed to be the seed of Abraham, and they were but only physically. Spiritually, they were of Satan and under his power and his control. John 8, Jesus said to the Jewish Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar, the father of lies. So that's why these these Jews, they would go around slandering Christians, telling lies that were completely false, the exact opposite of the truth, because as Jesus said, the truth was not in them, so they couldn't speak true about the Christians. There's a comfort amidst this pressure of slander. At the beginning of this verse, Jesus says, I know. That's the Greek word oida, to know fully understand and recognize among the the thousands of lies that were told Jesus says I know they're all lies I see what's happening I see the whole picture don't worry about it the the Smyrna Christians have having a greater regard for how God sees them would be essential to surviving this persecution because society couldn't regard them any lower such lies were told that the Christian love feasts were actually orgies, where Christians were accused of cannibalism because of distorted views of the Lord's Supper. Christians were accused of atheism because they worshipped an invisible God. They were called insurrectionists because they refused to worship the emperor and perform sacrifices to him. It is a horrible tactic of persecution that Satan uses against the church. Rarely, is someone persecuted and painted with nobility. Christians are persecuted for their faith in Jesus, but the world won't recognize that truth because Satan will cloak the persecution and the attack with a lie. 
Christians will get marked for child abusers, sex offenders, enemies of the state, bigots, insurrectionists, racists, because Satan will slander them and the world will listen. When someone slanders you, it ruins the way people see you. Your character is marred. And this was every day for a Christian in Smyrna. Citizens would look and see a Christian walking down the street and see a pervert. But verse 10, Jesus tells them, Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast some of you in prison so that you will be tested and you will have tribulation for 10 days, but be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Do not fear is literally fear nothing. No matter how small or how severe, the one who has overcome death says fear nothing. Even in the face of this next pressure, which is some will face prison. In the prisons that the Christians were thrown into, they are not like our prisons. They were rat-infested dungeons with little light, little food, full of feces because there was no plumbing. And each day that they stayed there, there, it was extended and that pressure just increased. And they were being tested. Tested means they'll be enticed to sin. And Jesus tells them, don't give in. That's what this pressure, this testing is all about, getting them to capitulate and recant their faith in Jesus. Because oftentimes, if someone did that, if they were willing to deny Christ, they would be set free. They would get their freedom from prison. Edicts and decrees went out making that the standing order. Or at minimum, uh, participate in emperor worship. Just incorporate some of the culture into the church. And not much has changed. It's still the push, tolerance, compromise. Smyrna was one of two churches that only received commendation and wasn't called to repentance. But they were also persecuted. And those two are connected. The other churches, they had some commendations, but in one area or another, they compromised and they were told to repent. Ephesus had left their first love, Pergamum adhered to the teaching of Balaam. Thyatira was Jezebel. And and where there was compromise, where the church let the world in, it deafened the blow of persecution. Because the enemy isn't going to attack himself, and the church would let some of the enemy in. While Smyrna held fast and remained pure. So they were persecuted. But know this, Their persecution is what purified them. We should consider that when we think about drawing close to God in our walk. And we sing songs like, Purify my heart, make me pure as gold. That comes by fire, the purification process. Trial and tribulation, persecution. We're inviting fire into our lives if it results in us drawing closer to the Lord and our purification. 2 Timothy 3.12 Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. John 3.20 For everyone who does evil, excuse me, for everyone who does evil hates light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So a quarter million of a people living in Smyrna living in darkness, banding together to war against the Christians of the city, day in and day out. They're not thankful, hey, I appreciate you exposing all of my evil deeds with your light. They hate them. And this would make for some long days. It probably felt like the city was laying siege against them. Siege warfare being a battle of endurance. Who can outlast the other? Who will run out of supplies? And the Christians had no food. When they were in prison, they were being starved. And when they were out of prison, no one would hire them. And they still couldn't eat. It was Christ filling their bellies. And the Holy Spirit suppressing their hunger pains. Jesus was all that they had. So Jesus informs them that this tribulation, you'll have tribulation for 10 days. 
was a common saying, it'll be for a short while. Hold on, hold heaven in your sights as the apostle Paul did, Romans 8, 18. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Jesus is saying, just hang in there a little bit longer. You're on the brink of eternity. And for many of them, they were because they would be martyred. So Jesus tells them at the end of verse 10, be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. Death would be the final pressure of their persecution, but it actually liberates the, the believer because they're attacked with death in this life, only ushering them into eternal life with the one whom they're dying for. And Jesus crowns the believer. It's probably not a literal crown talked about here, but he bestows upon them eternal life, the life that he promised them. 2 Timothy 2.11, it is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. Jesus will keep that promise. And all who are born again Christians believe and know that to be true. No matter how death approaches them, if, if it's the gallows or if they're at 80 years of age with cancer on a hospital bed, they shouldn't fear death if they truly possess the faith that they claim to have. Right? If I walk around with a cup I claim is full of water, and the day comes that cup is turned upside down, I know if the floor is going to be wet, or if I've been walking around with an empty cup. Right? Persecution just reveals the truth. It doesn't change it. People might lie about their faith, but someone either has faith or they don't. And persecution makes us confess the truth. If someone doesn't truly have faith, they'll deny Jesus under threat of a tax audit. But if someone has faith, you can't break them. They'll, they'll be faithful until death because they truly believe they know where they're going to spend eternity and they're happy to go. They're excited to meet Christ, their maker. We can't wait. Because of promises like verse 11. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death. He who overcomes means he who has faith. 1 John 5, 4. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. If you have faith, you will not be hurt by the second death. The first death being death physical, the body being separated, the soul and spirit physically dying, we're all slowly dying and will testify that hurts, right? Right? But Jesus tells us the second death won't hurt. Eternal damnation in hell won't be a problem for those who have faith. You will not be hurt. Not here in the original Greek language is the strongest possible negative you can express. The second death will not hurt you. Those with faith. Jesus said in Luke 12, 4, 5, I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed you, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. And that's Jesus. That's why he can tell you, you don't have to be afraid, because he's the one who would cast you into hell. He says, you have faith in me. You don't have to be afraid. It's not going to happen. He's taking care of it. A Christian shouldn't have one iota for fear of death or hell. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, 
How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor any, cre any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Knowing that in your bones, we want to be full of the word of God and his promises of eternal life today, so that if the day comes that we're stripped of everything else in this life, and our day in this life comes to an end, we have certainty. We're more certain of what's to come in the afterlife than this life. That should be true for every Christian. Who knows what tomorrow holds? We know what eternity does. Amen? If you're uncertain while you live, You'll be really uncertain in the face of death. And given the chance, you'll deny him in a heartbeat. I want to read some uh, excerpts from Fox's Book of Martyrs that give a glimpse into history of Christian martyrdom. Nero, who was Rome's emperor before Domitian, and that's who was ruling at the time John wrote these letters, um, he really spearheaded the Christian persecution for the ages to come. Nero even refined upon cruelty and contrived all manner of punishments for the Christians that the most infernal imagination could design. In particular, he had some sewed up in skins of wild beasts and then worried by dogs until they expired. And others dressed in shirts made stiff with wax, fixed to axle trees, and set on fire in his gardens in order to illuminate them. This persecution was general throughout the whole of the Roman Empire, but it rather increased than diminished the spirit of Christianity. In the course of it, St. Paul, St. Peter were mar martyred, Erastus, Aristarchus, Trophimus, Joseph, Ananias, and each of the 70. And then we have Domitian. He started reigning at 81. Domitian instituted that when any Christians were brought before the magistrates, a test oath was proposed. And when they refused to take it, death was pronounced against them. And if they confessed themselves Christians, the sentence was the same. They'd be put to death. Under his reign, Paul's disciple Timothy was pastoring in Ephesus. When at this period... As the pagans were about to celebrate a feast called Catagogian, Timothy, meeting the procession, severely reproved them for their ridiculous idolatry, which so exasperated the people that they fell upon him with their clubs and beat him so dreadful of a manner that he expired of the bruises two days later. Pliny the second wrote Trajan, the emperor to succeed Domitian, certifying him that there were many thousands of them put to death, of which none did anything contrary to Roman laws worthy of persecution. The whole account they gave of their crime, or error, whichever is to be called, amounted to only this explanation, that they were accustomed to a stated day to meet before daylight, and to repeat, gather, a set of form of prayer to Christ as a God, and to bind themselves by an obligation, not indeed to commit wickedness, but on the contrary, never to commit theft, robbery, or adultery, never to falsify their word, never to defraud any man, after which it was their custom to separate, reassemble, partake in a common 
harmless meal. And that was their crime worthy of death. Following Trajan was Marcus Aurelius Antonius. Marcus Aurelius followed about the year of our Lord 161 AD. A man of nature more stern and severe, and although in study of philosophy and civil government, no less commendable, yet toward the Christians, sharp and fierce, by whom was moved the fourth persecution. The cruelties used in this persecution were such that many of the spectators shuddered with horror at the sight and were astonished at the courage of the sufferers. Some of the martyrs were obliged to pass with their already wounded feet over thorns, nails, sharp shells. Upon their points, others were scourged until their sinews and veins lay bare. And after suffering the most excruciating tortures that could be devised, they were destroyed by the most terrible deaths. Germanicus, a young man, but a true Christian, being delivered to the wild beasts on account of his faith, behaved with such astonishing courage that several pagans became converts to a faith that inspired such fortitude. Polycarp, the venerable bishop of Smyrna. Now this is the Apostle John's disciple. And he was most likely present in Smyrna when this letter was delivered and read. Polycarp, hearing that persons were seeking for him, escaped but was discovered by a child. After feasting, the guards who apprehended him, desired, he desired an hour of prayer, which being allowed, he prayed with such fervency that his guards repented that they had been instrumental in taking him. He was, however, carried before the proconsul, condemned and burnt in the marketplace. The proconsul urged him, saying, Swear, and I will release thee. Reproach Christ. Polycarp answered, Eighty and six years I have served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king who hath saved me? At the stake, to which he was only tied but not nailed as usual, Excuse me. Excuse me. At the stake to which he was only tied but not nailed as usual, he assured them he could stand immovable. And the flames on their kindled sticks encircled his body like an arch without touching him. And the executioner, on seeing this, was ordered to pierce him with a sword. And when so great a quantity of blood flowed out, extinguished the fire. But his body, at the instigation of the enemies of the gospel, especially the Jews, was ordered to be consumed in the pile. And the request of his friends, who wished to give him a Christian burial, was rejected. They nevertheless collected his bones, as much of his remains as possible, and caused them to be decently buried. Uh, Jonathan, if you want to come up and guys get ready to pass out communion. A lot of the early church was buried in catacombs underground cemeteries. They didn't have money for the average funeral, so they tunneled. And in the walls, they dug out graves, and then they carved their own marble. And non-believers were buried in the catacombs as well. But it's interesting if you study the inscriptions of the tombstones of the non-believers. They read bleak, grim final words like, I was, now I am not, and I don't know what's become of me. But all over the Christian tombs, there are carvings of full sails and anchors, meaning the hope and the promise of a future life. A dove with an olive branch in its beak, a symbol recalling the salvation brought to Noah after the flood. They scream hope. But most of all, 
you'd find fish. In Greek, fish is written I-C-H-T-H-Y-S. I is Jesus, Jesus. C-H, Christos, Christ. T-H, Theos, of God. Y, Yuyos, Son. And S, Soter, Salvation. Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. His death on the cross is what makes our death a celebration, free of condemnation, full of hope. Let's remember that. And ask the Lord to prepare our hearts as the the bread and the cups are passed out. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind. But now I see The Lord has promised good to me His word, my hope secures He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures the earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine my chains are gone and I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood his mercy reigns unending love amazing grace unending love amazing Father, thank you for sending your son. Thank you for sending him for a people that you knew was not worthy to be saved, that we were filthy wretches. Thank you for sending your son who you knew didn't deserve to die, knowing that his body would be crushed and his blood would be spilt. Thank you for healing us by his stripes. Thank you for the sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys eat the bread and drink the cup. We all stand. It's important to remember.
That's why we were given the ordinance of community, uh, communion that Christ died paying in full our death penalty. And that when we die, there's nothing owed. So if it's ever our turn, we're not hesitant about dying. We can stand like Polycarp. You don't have to nail me down. I'm not going to move. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. Amen means you agree and so be it. Amen. Amen. Uh, Yemen, East Africa, West Africa, North Africa, India, Pakistan, Iran, North Korea. Thousands of Christians are abducted, slaughtered every year. And you know, the one thing is that they ask for. Ask of the believers in the West, you and me. Prayer. That's always what they ask for. Hebrews 13, 3. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them. And those who are ill-treated, since you yourselves are also in the body. Please remember to pray for them. Let's pray now. Lord, we want to lift up all of your children who are suffering at this very moment, being persecuted for their faith in you. We ask that you deliver them, Lord. If they not be delivered, you preserve them. That you be the wind in their sails. That you keep them holding fast to the faith Bring them relief from the pressure. Make your face smile upon them, Lord. Bring them love to whatever corner of the earth that they're in, whatever dungeon, whatever isolation they're undergoing, whatever family has cast them out, Lord. Wrap them up in your arms. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.